to the intro uh, wait, 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 wait. i see on the corner of my eye paolo is about to clap because he knows derek is so bad about this all right so we're gonna on the one damn you anyway welcome to <laughs> episode number x plus one of the carmudgeon show part of the haggerty podcast network <laughs> Jason, that's not Jason Camisa. He's no longer with us. Uh, and I'm Derek Tam hyphen Scott. In this episode, we discuss Ferraris and uh, specifically the 296 GTB. And Jason drops some bombshells about the continued existence of some Ferrari dynamics that make it difficult to engage with these cars. And then we do a little bit of a historical dive on these cars as well. I, what, what's happening to <laughs> Okay, well, stay tuned for more excitement on the Carmudgeon Show on this episode X plus one, 80 something. Porque no, 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 yes, no, 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 yes, no, 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 yes, we're into what's her name, Madeline, yes, Madeline Khan, Madeline Khan, and we're back. Hopefully, that high note was recorded. Uh, at least by beautiful. the A cam, it was. Yes. I don't think we have the B and C cams. I don't the com- think the D cam and the C cam. No one, we don't have C and D cams. This is, we have C A B C whatever yeah, the Camisa cam and the Derek cam. Oh, maybe it's the T hyphen S cam and the C cam. Anyway, um, all right. So look, can I just say one thing? Oh, Paolo's making all kinds of noise in the background. Uh, I, I want <laughs> this to- time instead of being apologetic, he rolled his eyes. <laughs> What did we decide he has resting bitch face? Exercising bitch Exercising bitch face. Bitch face. Active bitch face. A- agitated. Agitated <laughs> bitch face. Uh, okay. I'd like to start out this episode by um, saying that I fully appreciate that Ferrari has made the brand that they've made. The, Ferrari is the, is the most powerful. However. Well, it's the most powerful brand in the world, right? They make a huge amount of money on just... Brand off of its own shit. brand equity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and not aside from the cars, right? They are, I will go on a product launch for anything and we'll get a pencil that says BMW on it and I use it and I throw it out and we'll break it and lose it and give it a friend or whatever. If it's something that says Ferrari on it, I keep it because I'm an idiot. And I've never been into Ferraris. I, was, I didn't grow up with a Ferrari in my wall. I just, did, I don't, mm, mm, not a sports sort of showy car guy. Um, so there's something magical about this brand and that has necessarily happened that that was not an accident right that started from enzo down managing the way this the perception of the brand is up to and including perhaps um to use chris harris's term cheating on tests right i recently spent some time with a ferrari 296 gtb um i will have published a camisa verdict at some point uh i didn't get a lot of footage which really upsets me because i was planning on doing an icons on ferrari 296 gtb i think it's a very interesting car this is ferrari's ferrari's first mid-engine v6 um this is effectively the replacement for the mid-engine v8 even though they're not saying it um and they're not saying that no this lives together with f8 really for the moment no one's saying anything it's just look over there so <clears throat> do they cost the same um the the one that i had was five hundred thousand dollars huh and it didn't have an assetto fiorano sport package which thank god because it doesn't have that horrible paint scheme let me let me start by saying this car is fucking gorgeous gorgeous stunning sexy beautiful understated and I, what i love most about it is it's non-pretentious and just pretty and elegant and feminine and gorgeous and all oh, the, the ways, looks the looks right and all the ways i was gonna that say five hundred thousand like, dollars sounds a little bit pretentious yeah yeah no no, no. I mean, no no that's not pretentious that's expensive um but the thing looks it reminds me of a th- when i look at a 308 when i start looking at a ferrari 308 i can't stop because you look at it first and i'm like yeah supercar don't care and then the more you look at it the more beautiful that car gets really yeah um interesting to i do not have that reaction to I, that car i figured that was gonna that be the case just by the look on your face. I never liked the, the 308. Yes, sure, whatever, right? I, I'm not a supercar kind of guy. 
But 296 does the same thing where there's a million details that are hidden that you don't notice initially. And on 296, what I love most about it is those are all the arrow bits that were over the top on display are over the top on display on 812, 812 Competizione, which to me looks like a mansory body kit that's just grotesque and gaudy and, you know, not... The antithesis of what a Ferrari should be. To me, Ferrari and Lamborghini have always existed, not always, since 1966. They have, when the Miura arrived, uh, Lamborghini and Ferrari have existed in opposition to each other. I think it's really demonstrated by the fact that Geneva of 1966, the motor show in March, there were two, there was a Ferrari introduced and there was a Lamborghini introduced. The Ferrari that was introduced was the 330 GTC, a car that is generally regarded to be kind of boring looking. And then at the same show, of course, Lamborghini comes out with the Miura. And so that division occurred at, at a very specific place and time in Switzerland in 1966 and has continued on pretty much unchanged since then. Uh, y- yes, I would say that Lamborghini really fell into its own with the later Countaches where they just went more and more and more outrageous when Ferrari didn't, right? I mean, so I see your point is that Ferrari was, you know, has always been sort of more subtle and restrained and grown up and Lamborghini was like, put me in neon green and put spoilers on it and just be boisterous and outgoing. Um, they've definitely come closer to center, right? Where Lamborghini now, the Huracan, that, that whole design language is not outrageous. No, it's talk. it has a lot of the same language, but it's a little bit more refined. But it is very yeah. triangle forward, a lot of straight mm-hmm. lines, very wedgy. Right. Ferrari mm-hmm. has also gotten increasingly extroverted. Uh, but which, then went back, right? Aroma, yes. for example, is, I think, really pretty and it's understated. And not, not every detail I love. I give the car a really good review because I think it's a, it's a return to form for this brand. And 296 is perfect. Everywhere you look, there are arrow vents and tweaks and uh, and spoilers and flicks and all this other shit for arrow that needs to be there. But they're all hidden in this elegant form. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've driven 488 Pista, right? I have, yes. Okay. So we've both driven pieces 710 horsepower, if I remember. I only drove a prototype. Um, unbelievably fast to the point where I said, nope, too much, too fast. What was your impression of that car? Similar. I mean, it's hmm. just like, what am I supposed to do with this? Right? right? What? Why, why, I guess, was what I left with. <laughs> so that, that car left me very cold. I didn't like, I don't like the styling of it. Um, I like the regular, if I had to pick a regular 488 better without that crazy hood scoop thing in the trunk. I mean, 458 is really the... I mean, if we're going to go, we're going to do that, it's going to be 360. I mean... 360 looks like a melted cough drop to me. Is it Ludens or like a Ludens cough drop or like a Ricola? Uh, Not anyway, that. That's um, too Swiss. That's Swiss, yeah. Uh, is there an Italian cough drop? Yeah, there was a little lemon... Anyway, um... Point point is, I, I thought that I thought four day pista was too much, and I just thought, okay, we're at the at the limit here. I got in two ninety six, which has a V six, which is a monumental sea change for Ferrari. It's we should probably discuss. And I floored it, and I laughed myself sick. It's a hybrid, so it can run on electric power alone. I did I posted a video to Instagram where I raced it in EV mode against the E Golf, and the E Golf gets it off the line, and then the Ferrari catches it and passes it at about ninety two, and the E Golf is limited to eighty five. But it's a pretty close race. It's very cool. And by the way, I did that to show how quick the Ferrari is in all electric mode. Like seven and something to sixty is not a slow car in all electric when it's a tiny motor and a tiny battery there for for electrical assist. Um, Gas engine fires up. That V6 sounds every bit as good as a V12. Every bit. It is spectacular. It's a 8,000 RPM V6 that sounds like a 4,000 RPM V12. Fine. Sounds amazing. The note is changing all the time. There's all this like intricacy and um, uh, like different loads at, at different RPMs start to sound very different. You hear a guttural intake roar. You, the engine smooths out and then go fucking fabulous acoustically Good, it is so it a has 10. texture texture 10 and it's so goddamn fast that i literally did 100 mile an hour sideways burnout along on the highway without meaning to like mm. it's genuinely that seems excessive too fast but i didn't care and this was the weird part is i didn't care I, I, pista too fast 296 probably faster than pista didn't care there's something about so, i think it's i think you're gonna like this I think the V6 sounds so much better than the, that the the Pista, turbocharged V8. flat plane V8 that mm-hmm. that that's what did it because the V8's a little well, bit Well, it's just up. you're getting a reward. You're getting it's not just speed that you're getting in exchange for the the 
experience. That you're yeah. getting something that has and genuine character, which is what a Ferrari should have. It should, exactly. Steering is spectacular on the car. It's got that Ferrari weightlessness where you, no matter what you do, you can flick it left, right, left, right, left, right, and, you know, try to get the suspension. It never gets out of phase. Up. Never gets out of phase. You don't feel any body motions. You don't feel bumps. It is spectacular. Um, and so I really wanted to do an Icons episode on it. And Ferrari has been working with me for months on this. And we're finally getting ready to lock everything down. And they're like, so... A um, couple of notes. A couple of notes. We're going to send you race tires and street tires. We're going to give you an Assetto Fiorano, which is the sport package. And I'm like, okay, it's going to take some of the wind out of the argument of how beautiful the car is because the paint scheme on the Assetto Fiorano is over the top and I think contradicts the design of the car, whatever. Uh, but they're like, okay, so no instrumented testing. And I'm like, uh, okay, no comparisons. Okay. To anything. To anything. No. What lap, about a donkey? No lap times. Mm, that's N- No numbers on anything. No other cars in the episode that don't have a Ferrari badge on it that are in current production. And no Ferraris unless they're X 20 years old or whatever it was. And I was like, okay, then no icons. We're done. There's nothing more to discuss here. And our point as a, as a united front of the production team was the way icons works is it's a zoomed out high, you know, high level perspective with context. And you can't give context if you can't put other players in. I don't need to drag race this car against something I wanted to, but you know, that puts it in perspective just how fast this car is. Not, not allowed. Okay, you're giving it Assetto Fiorano. Fiorano being the name of the racetrack that's in front. And I'm not allowed to track it. Oh, you can track it. You just can't get a lap time. Well, what the fuck do I have Randy Popes there for? What? what? The whole thing fell apart and I got really pissed. I'm very, very upset about this. And again, let's go back. I gave him a, a, a big congratulations on your brand. Like you guys have done amazing things and everyone looks up to you. And part of that is because they very carefully manage how their brand is presented. You're not going to see a Ferrari and something else in the same ad. You're not going to, there's, there's, there are rules. But I think the entire generation of people under the age of 30 don't give a fuck about any modern Ferraris and it's because they don't see them. Porsche's lined up. We can get a GT3, GT3 RS, GT4 RS. What do you want? How can we do this? Let's play. Well, now the GT3 RSs are going for $200,000 over invoice. I'm making that up, right? You know, all of Porsche's GT cars are going over MSRP, huge markups, lines out the door, sold out. Yeah, 296 is sold out too, but come on. I bet you anything, it's the future gener- generation of collectors who are buying GT3s and the past generation of collectors who are buying 296s. Hmm. And that's a shame because th- that is the best mid-engine Ferrari in the pot probably ever. And certainly in the past 20 years. And I don't get to tell that story to people because they're so protective of their brand. So why is Ferrari so afraid of context? Because they don't want to lose. Ferrari, remember, if you Do were, you think they might? In, in, no, that's the fucking infuriating point. My point, my this pitch is like to uh, them, hot people are really insecure. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> what it is. But look, the hot person can't be in the room with somebody hotter i guess i mean if i were in charge in their defense right if i were in charge of the ferrari brand i would also be protective about losing lamborghini's excuse to me every time i ask for them for a car for camisa's ultimate drag race replay is our customers aren't interested in straight line speed to which i respond right of course they are you just don't want to lose fine just fucking don't lie to me ferrari's thing is no other brands no other one no one we can't we have to be seen on our own and literally pitched an entire episode to me about the hood because the hood the shut line of the hood that where the hood hits the fenders doesn't line up with a trim inside the headlight where the headlight turns into side marker light and vent there's a vent that goes right to the brakes you can see right there super cool the reason why is because the press that presses the hood was uh, maxed out in width and they don't have a press wide enough to have pressed a hood to the correct width I'm like that's not a fucking re- big picture. Why would you want to review that? First of or all, you reveal sh- that. You should have never pointed it out to me because I noticed it. And I was like, well, that's a fuck up. All right, so maybe they were trying to couch the fact that I would have said, well, that's a little bit awkward on a car that's otherwise really beautiful. And there's an engineering reason behind it. Interesting. One data point. That's not a review, and it's certainly not an icons episode that I spend a large amount of money and months and months of work to put these cars in perspective and gather around other stuff that really makes it all sing together. I was so pissed. But I don't blame them. I just think it's now gone too far. Like if if I can't do, if I can call Ferrari and say, guys, you know me, you trust me. 
I'm not about numbers. I don't really care about that. I drive a three, the, the Ferrari that I chose to buy finally as a grown up is a 308 GT4. The ugly duckling, whatever. It's not about numbers or, or show off or anything, any of the things that you guys are worried about. It's about the experience. And this thing nails the experience and the elegance and the all of the things that a Ferrari should. And it's a V6. And there's such an amazing lesson to, to tell there because it's not a 60, it's not a 72, it's not a 90, it's a 120 degree V6. There's only two of them. That's it. It's Ferrari and McLaren right now. Let's tell that story. Nope. Can't do it. Hmm. Mm. So. Um, so that was the next best thing. What? The McLaren? <laughs> Your rant. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. I mean, I, I could do, I guess, I could do something on McLaren Arturo. Uh, no, we're working. We turned totally different directions. I, you know, I'd love to revisit 296 at some point, but I'm going to have to call Italy and say, I'm sorry for our North America is just hysterical. They're just uh, isn't Italy hysteric. the same? Or I mean, it's not the only, it's not unique to the United States, I guess. If given what happened with Chris Harris, for context, what happened yes. with Chris Harris is he was blacklisted and not allowed to drive any more Ferraris because he started to try and tell the truth. Listen, um, I'm probably going to be blacklisted already from this episode. I I don't think so. First of all, I'm a big fan of what Ferrari does, and I'm a big fan of the engineering. What Chris pointed out is that, and he did the he did so in a very honest way. Ferrari, he would say cheat. I would say optimize, right? There, there are times in history that I think Ferrari did cheat, right? I think that the original test of the 599, was it? Um, if you look at the acceleration numbers, it just couldn't be. It couldn't happen. A car with that weight and that, um, that horsepower number wouldn't have been able to accelerate the way it was. It was probably an Enzo motor that they put in it, right? In the age of turbocharging, anyone can cheat because it's computer code, right? But the reality is every car company can optimize. And I don't think Ferrari cheats. I'm be honest about that. I think Ferrari optimizes. They give us the best example and they make sure that the conditions are the best. So they want to send out an engineering team. And this is one of their reasons for no, no numbers. Let me be honest about this. They don't want me to do uh, instrumented testing numbers, which of course I want to do, unless there's a team of people from Italy there on location. That's very different from, say, Porsche, who throws the keys and said, good luck and let, let us know if you need any spare tires, right? And they're just confident in their product. Ferrari wants to make sure that their guys are there to make sure that the, the car performs to its best abilities. That's not really a bad thing. Um, where it gets weird is, for example, the, the best example I can give you, this is Lamborghini Aventador. When that car launched, because Italians are Italians, the cars that we are, were, all the magazines were able to drive were not eligible for testing. This is the car you drive, and then we have one specially prepared for you to over here to test. Car and Driver did it back in the day, and I'm I'm gonna fuck up the numbers, but it was like 36, 40 something was the weight of the test car um, when they tested it. And it did whatever it did, 2.8 to 60, which was you know record breaking and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, I think it was Aaron Robinson who now works at Haggerty, um, went and got another Lamborghini for a story, and while he was there, tested it and weighed it. And the production car was 4,064 pounds. <laughs> okay, 400 pounds, i.e. 10% of the weight is not possible. That is not possible in, in production car variation. That was a cheater chassis without question. That was cheater glass. That was no sound insulation. That was cheater seats. That was cheater wheels, brakes, whatever the fuck was, was going on with that Aventador. There's no way that a customer car is gonna weigh 3,600 pounds when another one weighs 44,000 and change. Um, that's flat out cheating. I, but every car company could do that. Like the field is level. I can't go and verify that every, every part and every car that I test is production car. Does Ferrari optimize better than others? I don't know. I know that they have a team of engineers. If something goes wrong when I'm testing, sure, okay. I don't know. It is a great Ferrari tradition. The F50 was also, uh, this is a great story I learned what, when researching the F50. Uh, Ferrari wouldn't let anybody test them. Uh, and so I think finally car and driver did their first test in 1997 when the car was two years old or something like that. And they explained what, why it had taken them so long to get a car to test. And so they were like, yeah, we couldn't get one from Ferrari. So we called up enthusiasts who own these cars and they were like, yeah, sure. Feel free. Mm -hmm. And then they would come back and be like, oh, actually, yeah, I can't, uh, yeah, yeah I can't do that after all, for whatever reason. It happened like three or four times. Yep. Uh, and it was because 
uh, Ferrari had a number of issues. Well, so with, when the F40 came out, everybody bought them and was speculating on them and people were flipping them. And so they had this whole thing where you couldn't buy an F50. You had to lease it for some number of time. You had to put a bunch of money down. It was like half quarter of a million dollars down or something and then lease it for some number of dollars. And then you could buy it at the end of that. And they were trying to crack down on speculation. Uh, but what the net of that was, was that you didn't own the car. Ferrari owned the car and you didn't get one of those cars unless you were a proven enthusiast of Ferraris with multiple other Ferraris in the past and no record of flipping cars and all of that. And right. uh, so when they would, people would say, I'm g going to allow the magazine to test the car, they would be like, ooh, well, in that case, you should probably consider your relationship with Ferrari terminated. Uh, yep. And so all these people were like, oh, I don't want to, you know, upset the Don mm -hmm. or whatever. And so it was really hard. And then eventually at some point there was one guy who had such a, like, I think he was part of Ferrari's u.s racing uh ecosystem basically where his relationship was so secure with ferrari he's just like yeah fuck it mm -hmm. and i think he was like but the one condition is i have to be allowed to drive v max the car i mm -hmm. want to be the one to v max because he wanted to be there to do it right <laughs> yeah um so i mean this is a great ferrari tradition apparently it goes back listen three that happens today now with all big car companies right i mean i did a, a video with a chiron and I, I spoke to one owner first not the one that we shot with and his first concern was let me make sure that bugatti is okay with me lending you my chiron so that they don't cancel my order for mistral mm -hmm. which is the convertible chiron that's coming um the the owner whose car we did use expressed similar concern but bugatti had already expressed interest in working with me and they just couldn't get me a chiron in time um, so they seemed to be okay with the fact that we were using this pure sport and the owner was incredibly generous in letting us use it. But that, that's always the case, right? So you have big high dollar cars with multiple, you know, waiting lists that are far greater than the production. Right. Plan. They have much more happen. ability right. to sell the cars, right? If they were desperate to sell cars, this is, you know, different story. Choose some yeah. year where they can't move material. Well, this hasn't been true since probably the eighties, but if there was some time when they couldn't sell cars, right. not specifically Ferrari, but for example, at some point, you know, Aston Martin couldn't sell enough cars mm -hmm. to stay in business or, you know, whatever. Right now. I mean, mm -hmm. they probably are. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, that's, it, it is the Ferrari mystique has the pluses and minuses. Look, they've sold out of 296s, clearly doing something right. But if there's no test and no historical record of what this car can do, I don't think those secondhand values will, will stay where they should be or where they would have mm. otherwise been. Which I think just, Ferrari is such a transcendent brand with so much cachet that I, there will always be somebody there with a check. A check. But I mean, look at some of the previous cars values, right? I mean, so we have... We have a 308 GT4 was a twenty thousand dollar car forever. A 308 GDB was a forty thousand dollar car forever. Three twenty eight, thirty, yeah, <laughs> thirty thousand. I mean, not all sure. of it. It's not always been the, the way a, it is right now. It's also a change in the market, though, and I think those cars are still objectively pretty inexpensive for what they are in, in terms of experience. I mean, I'd so much rather drive around in any carbureted Ferrari instead of a well, three fifty five, of course, or three sixty. Here he goes again. I know. Um, yeah, so I, you know, the story that I wanted to talk about with 296 was really interesting because it really, it, it was, it sort of occurred to me that there's this huge mystique around the, the idea of mid-engine. Over the last 20 years, all of my favorite Ferraris are front-engine. Um, you know, F12 is the highlight for me. Mm -hmm. 599 GTO is really close, but then we're talking crazy money. Yeah. Uh, F12 is something I could drive every day. It's, it's not a manual, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, I didn't particularly love from everything I've heard, the 599 manual wasn't all that wonderful anyway, because it was designed to be a, uh, an automatic F1. and didn't yeah. have a uh, didn't have a flywheel on it. Um, and this is from an owner of one who doesn't really drive it uh, because of that reason. Um, but the the mid engine is it, it, the thing is a huge mystique. And if I think about it, my three least well handling cars are my three mid engine cars. Mm -hmm. All right, Honda Beat, it's a K car. Um, and Ferrari 308 GT4, okay, it's a 70s mid engine car. Lotus Elise. Mm, okay. That has no excuse. Let's, that should be stellar. Well, it is stellar in some measures and stellar in, and not in others. Mid-engine cars are really, really difficult to get right. And they typically are understeering pigs most of the time. Well, that's because they're trying to prevent people from offing themselves. Yes and no. The problem is you wind up with handling that's very changeable. So yes. even the last 718 GT4 was beautiful for the first lap of on a racetrack and then it's just a four oh this is a four liter um and but it would fall into understeer after the first lap because the front tires would just get too much heat in them um and so that car changed its attitude continually in a way that a car with 
for equal sized tires and better weight distribution just doesn't seem to do. Um, and the Lotus just understeers. The thing about the Lotus is it just understeers until it fucking explodes sideways. And a car with a low polar moment of inertia and all the all the, okay. the weight in the middle wants Let's, to... Low polar moment of inertia. The best example of this is imagine uh, you're holding a barbell versus a dumbbell and they both weigh 50 pounds. The barbell is the one that has the weights at the end. The mm -hmm. dumbbell is the little short one. Right? But it if still you hold, has the weights at the end. They both Yes, but they both weigh 50 pounds, but one's a lot longer than the other. Which one is easier to turn with your wrist? Okay, that's a demonstration of wheelbase. I'm sorry to contradict you on air. That's a demonstration of wheelbase. Well, length. yes, but you could imagine you could have them be the same length and have... Or you can have two things. One is a rod that weighs 50 pounds. That's a foot long. And another one's a dumbbell that weighs 50 pounds and is a foot long. The rod has equal distribution of weight the whole way through it. And sure. a dumbbell weighs a lot at the ends. The sure. dumbbell, once it starts to turn, is going to want to turn into a, a, yes, you know, it's a spinny go round. Right. Um, and so cars, mid-engine cars have a very low polar moment of inertia. So the weight is concentrated in one area between the wheels, inside the wheelbase, preferably at the center of gravity between the, the driver and the, and the engine. And they don't want to go straight. They want to turn. But the problem Which is... Which is why they were first used for racing cars. Yeah. And in a racing car environment, that's exactly what you want. You want it to be able to pivot. The problem is once they start to go, there's nothing... There's not this flywheel effect that, yes. where they start to turn slowly, giving you a chance to correct it. And they are monsters. So you want to induce understeer in them. You want to... Yes, if you're going to sell it to the them. public. Yeah. Um, and so... Yeah, I, you know, my best handling cars are 50-50 are front front rear, or their makes, you know, nears makes no difference. But the mid-engine thing has a huge mystique for handling great, whatever. But well, the, and there's a certain aesthetic character to those cars that has been... Not to the 3 g 4 No, but, uh, I mean, Mira or yeah. Countach or Tessarossa or... 288 GTO or F40 or it Alpha is 4C it is or, in yeah. it is ingrained in the enthusiast mindset and especially of sort of people who are not of the our mindset people who are you know like a teenage boy right mm -hmm. that's the look that is the the you're looking to, for something that puts as much distance between a regular car and that car between and your mom's the, minivan uh, yeah, or SUV, and, yeah. a, and a mid-engined car yeah. does that yeah, whether you realize it or not, right? I mean, I don't think people are really conscious of the fact that front engine longitudinal rear wheel drive cars have different proportions necessarily than front engine economy boxes. One of them just looks sporty yeah. with that dash to axle ratio that designers yes. are always talking about. The other one just kind of looks like a lump. Yeah. And they could have the same styling elements on it, but that proportion is the first thing we notice. Mm -hmm. um, and mid-engine cars have a different proportion. They're slow at the front, they're tall at the back, they're they look like they're ready to pounce. Um, but all of this is to say that Ferrari mid-engine cars have not actually lived up to, in the, in, through the majority of history, haven't really lived up to my expectations um, in terms of being amazing driver's car. They're, they're often great. Some of them are unbelievable. That, that Stratos, that cut down F430 is a car that I will dream about for the rest of my life. Um, you must drive a Dino at some point. <laughs> yes. Sign me up. But the, Although the Stratos is better because the wheelbase is shorter and the car is lighter. Okay, fair enough. But the same V6, right? But that's perfect, perfect timing to bring up the Dino. Because I think people forget Ferrari is not married to any one cylinder count, right? So Ferrari, yes. we think now, I think you think V12 because you're 80, 95 years old. Most people think a oh, flat plane V8. Um, and hmm. that the, the sort of rhetoric of ferrari's first v6 was so embarrassing that enzo wouldn't even put his own name on it and he had to call it a different you know if it didn't have 12 cylinders it wasn't really a ferrari so i should call it dino <clears throat> i need to point out that dino came from alfredino which is little alfred because alfred was enzo's son who died at 20 Three? He was born in 19... He was, died in 1956. Okay. Uh, he was... Yeah, I was, think he was 24. To some, some horribly young age, this poor kid died. If you were embarrassed by something, you wouldn't name it after your dead son who you respected. But the Dino name, I think, predated his death. Sure. But I'm talking about the Dino road car, right? I mean, people are like, oh, well, that's not a real Ferrari because Enzo wouldn't put his name on it. He put the name of his dead son on there. I think... I don't know. Maybe he was just that much of an egoist. You think so? I don't know, it's possible. I've heard he was kind of an egoist. I mean, I've heard he's an asshole. 
Yeah. Like that's sort of <laughs> foregone. But I mean, I just really don't, I, sure. Maybe he thought Ferrari has 12 cylinders, but then what about the Monza, the 750 Monza? Anything for racing. That was a four cylinder. Yes. And the 500 TRC. That was a four cylinder. Mm -hmm. And so Ferrari through the ages, I don't, I don't think most of my friends don't seem to know this. Ferrari made four cylinders, V6s. In the 50s, yeah. V8s, Yeah, V12. 206 race car, SP, and uh, the D50. Um, Never even heard of that. Uh, the D50 was... Derek a, 50? Uh, a car that Ferrari picked up mid-season in 1955 from Lancia, and they, I think, Alberto Ascari had died suddenly. Uh, he wasn't even racing he was testing some car and he showed up at well while the car was being tested. I think this was at Monza and he just got in the car in like a t-shirt and was like going to go rip off a few laps and then orbited the car and went off the banking at Monza and died. Uh, anyway, the, he was the star driver of Lancia during their Formula One season. And I think this was 1955, if I remember correctly. Uh, and you would so, know you were there. <clears throat> yes, I was uh, in the stand. I was the first on the scene <laughs> of the accident. Um <laughs> And so mid-season, Lancia's just like, here, Ferrari, have all this shit mm -hmm. that we were running. And that that car was a car where they the engine was diagonal and the drive shaft went diagonally through the passenger compartment to the transaxle so that they could... Um, <laughs> and I think sobs are weird? Yes. How did I not Quite know? Quite literally, that? the drive shaft ran diagonally through the cockpit and then the, the rear axle is pointed towards... And the engine is at an angle. It's like maybe 15 or 20 degrees. It's not, not nothing. It's not yeah. like four degrees. Um, anyway, Ferrari raced those cars and the, they are, um, quad cam. I think they're four or, and I mean, six or eight cylinders. Mm. Uh, so yes, they, they were running F1 races, even in non 12 cylinder cars, in addition to running, you know, sports cars like the Monza and the 500 TRC. Uh, and then their first their, um, endurance sports car racing cars, 206 SPs and stuff like that were also V6s. V6s. So there's a long, and those cars are quite valuable today. I mean, it doesn't materially affect the car's value i have still like we, we said i've never driven a dino but the noise of the videos that you've sent me and you, you don't have a video of you redlining one right like you're just these are customer cars and you're being nice mm, to them there's probably something from the stratos video mm. i don't know i, I want to hear that thing at full song because what i heard in the sort of mid-range and like three four thousand rpm area was just otherworldly yeah because most v12s don't actually sound as good as people think they do um, most of them don't most of them but some the ones that are amazing are just amazing i mean obviously gordon murray's new v12 is like un, that cosworth v12 is unbelievable um 599 gto f12 all the modern ferrari v12s are amazing aventadors um i'm still a guy i need webers sure i agree with you intake intake plus mechanical plus exhaust always beats just a tuned exhaust which is what the aventador is in the in an aventador it sounds like absolute garbage it sounds like a garbage truck it's awful um, but outside it's, it's the best sounding engine ever made, I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I just, I just think it's kind of important for us to, to drive home the point that a V6 from Ferrari, even though I am on record, I think the first episode of this, of the podcast was V6s, oh, V6s are, not are not right by, by Jesus. Jesus. Yes. And now I've driven one that is, first of all, it's 120 degrees, which is a V6's natural balanced form. So 180 degrees which would be a flat six is naturally balanced. So is 120. 60 requires a couple tricks. 90 requires balance shafts lot. plus split yes. and crank shafts. And I, I think the, the V6s I like the best that I've experienced firsthand are 60s. They're all I mean, 60s. I don't yeah. like, I, I don't think I've ever met a 90 degree V6 that I liked. Yeah. 60. Um, there were some 65s also. Um, who does 65? Why do I know? It's either Alfa Romeo or Lancia. I can't remember. It was one of the, either the Busso or the Lancia V6 is 65, 65 degrees. Yeah, and that was probably just... Unless it's know, the Ferrari one. It's one of those three is a, is a 65. I think the Dino V6 was, was 65, and that's probably just a packaging reason. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for the, to be able to get bigger valves in usually is what, what the problem was. Um, but yeah. But it's a, it's a tremendous motor. And to me, like, I'm less... I adhere less to specific rules and more just what is the experience that I get in that particular car. And that car... Certainly a 246 or a Stratos delivers in a way that I just don't care what it is. <laughs> so, Batter, you would you would take a 246 Dino over any of the flat plane V8 for us? Absolutely. Without question. Without a moment of hesitation. 
If there was if, not even a moment of if you there, if there were, okay, if you if, if there are dollars involved, then I guess I would choose a three hundred eight, which is exactly a three hundred eight GT four, which is exactly what I did. Sorry, but other than that, uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's probably one of my, even among some of the twelve cylinder Ferraris of that era. Actually, I prefer the 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 two. What the two forty six has to it is this ability to. The car is very lithe. It is very. Um, agile it, i feel comfortable in that car it's a car that i feel a desire to really use a lot of its capability the v12 ferraris of that era can sometimes be intimidating the bot the transitions sometimes are a little bit uh i don't know no, they're a little bit non-linear i guess there's a linearity and a naturalness that reminds me of an early 911 that's present in a 246 that just feels right to me and i resisted liking 246s for a long time i always thought i mean f- God, all these old guys would come through and they'd be like, oh, I bought one of these when I was in college because it was like, you know, $6,400 and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so the, in that context, they were sort of looked down upon because oh, you, yeah. we bought them because you couldn't afford a 12-cylinder car. Mm-hmm. But as I experience more of them, I actually, the, the more I, I drive them, the better I like them. And I like cars that do that. The, the more you drive it, the better you like it. Mm-hmm. There's sometimes where you like delude yourself or, or convince yourself that you like something because you've built it up or because it has this reputation or because it exists in a certain place in the hierarchy mm-hmm. and then you experience it. And like anyone who's driven a first gen NSX or a Ferrari 355. Yeah. I'm going to duck. I'm going to hide from the camera here in case they throw some. <laughs> in case tomatoes yeah. come spewing forth from it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, we have discussed this, but a lot of it is just reference points and experiencing mm-hmm. a, a breadth of, of other cars. And if you have done that, then uh, then you can make those judgments. Um, I find it amazing that you were that quick to say two forty six over any mid-engine. over any other mid engine Ferrari. So because of course that includes the flat twelves, right? So the flat twelve okay. mid engine cars. Yeah, so f- yeah, five twelve TR is up there. F fifty is up there. F forty. Um, those are the f- those are my four favorite mid engine Ferraris. Okay, the F forty F. Well, fair enough. They're not the F forty wasn't a twelve, but F. 50 i've never dri- i've never driven either one of them i drove a 280 gto which is mechanically similar to an f40 right and that was uh in terms f- of uh in terms of drive in terms line, of yeah. drive, that was fucking exquisite um everything about that car was exquisite um but the the, the flat 12 cars all right so th- i i did a i did <laughs> a spotlight episode which is the predecessor to Re- revelations which was the show that i came up at EC- ecme when we were working together there um to try to uh, to do a COVID safe lockdown safe show. So we had, uh, we had a 365, uh, BB. BB. It was, it was 365, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was 365 BB, a Testarossa and a 512 TR, which are all sort of the same car expanded on. Right. Ish. Right. Yeah. Um, I think so it let's, let's go over the history for, I, cause even I, I like I had, when we started that episode, I had to really go back and look. So the, I, the, the idea of a flat 12, started out in production with the 365 BB. Berlin at a boxer is what it was supposed to stand for, but this is now, conf- I was able to confirm this with Ferrari's historian. BB stood for Brigitte Bardot, period. There was there the design inspiration for the body of the car. That's why that was called BB. And some PR guy was like, Berlin at a boxer. It's well, not a fucking boxer. Well, interestingly, the cover of the owner's manual has the word boxer on it. Yeah, they all, they, they double down on it, but yeah. it, in development. So, of course, you can't launch a car and say, yes, we are inspired by the breasts of, um, <laughs> of any na- in, in, in name of a living person. You can't do that. So somebody at somewhere was like, we better come up with something. But it's not a boxer. So a boxer, har- horizontal, uh, oh God, why is this? Why are we so nerdy? A, a horizontally opposed engine that is a boxer has pistons that move opposite. So if they if these two pistons share one plane, they're going to come close to each other and further away. Mm-hmm. And so in, out, in, out, much like a boxer would put, I guess, hit their gloves together. I, I don't watch boxing. Um, I like to go to bars and watch people fight in real life. <clears throat> um, a typical non-boxer horizontally opposed, i.e. flat engine, has pairs of cylinders that share the same crank pin and so they move in the same direction. The BB was not a boxer, it's a it's basically a 180 degree V12. Um, so they share crank pins and they move in the same direction. Um, so f- 365 shared its 
so we've talked about this in the past that and uh, car companies typically engineer one combustion chamber. So it's one valve piston sort of combination. Um, bore stroke combination. Bore stro- what is it? Bore, bore stroke. Stro- well, not even just bore. Yeah, bore stroke plus valves plus cam drive or whatever. Yes. And you can just expand it however many cylinders you need in a row. It's sort of cut and paste, 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 paste. Um, and so that came from the 365 uh, Daytona motor. Yes, which before that in two cam form instead of four cam form came from the 365 GTC and GT2 plus two. Okay, and it was the GTC slash four that was the four cam? The GTC four was the four 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 cam, cam, which had arrived in the Daytona in 68, and then the GTC four arrived in 70. Interesting. So there was a two cam version and a four cam version version. of that engine. So the four cam version of that engine wound up... All of these are V12s, not 180 degree. These are... 160, uh, 60 degree V12. V12. That cylinder configuration, bore, bore stroke, piston, valves, everything else wound up in the flat 12s. And then also the 308 V8 was the same mm-hmm. thing. Um, so they sort of expanded that in a bunch of different ways. So it started out as a 365 BB, mm-hmm. um, which was panned by the press for not being usable. And this is where the car journalists get it wrong. Yeah, it is. Um, it's more usable than a Mira. Oh my God. And a Countach. I mean, combined times four. Yeah. I mean, it, it actually is a fairly usable car, but I but think, the, it, the, I think that it also depends on reference points. So this is an interesting thing. In the late 60s, Ferrari, I might have overpromised by saying this is an interesting thing. This is a thing. <laughs> I'm interested. Uh, in, the, in the late 60s, so Ferrari, of course, now has front-engined two-seat V12 cars mm-hmm. and has had that since the dawn of time. Uh, and there has always been... You know, so this is 550 Maranello and 599 and F12 and 812 now. Uh, in the 1960s, you had that uh, in the form of the Daytona and the 275 GTB4, but you could also at the same time buy a different two-seat front-engined V12 Ferrari. So there was for four years overlap where you could choose between your, cho- you had your choice of two different uh, two-seat V12 front-engined Ferraris, in addition to the four-seat ones, which you could also buy. I don't think I realize this. There so this is the three. Different, yes. Okay. So this, you could buy the 275 GTB or the 330 GTC. Okay. Or you could buy the 365 GTC or the Daytona. So there was quite, the, this seems redundant. And the reason why Ferrari did this was that before when they were having racing cars in the two, form of the 250, there were two cars also, basically. There was the racing car, which was the GTO, or there was the Lusso. Uh, and so when the 275 came out, they were like, oh, this car, we're, it won Le Mans in its class in 65 and 66 and 67. And so like this is a racing car, effectively. This is kind of spiritually, we are imagining this is a successor of the GTO since we took it racing and won the GT class at Le Mans with it. It's mm-hmm. a race car. So we need to make another front-engine V12 two-seat car that's more useful for like the average person who wants to drive it every day and commute it in it. You know, is mean, a businessman instead of a playboy, mm-hmm. basically. Uh, and so... That was where the 365 engine first appeared in two cam form was for those sort of more torquey, lower, lower, R- <laughs> the power peaks at 7,000 instead of 8,000 RPM, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is a very Ferrari thing to do. So the, the boxer was supposed to replace the Daytona and the Daytona still had these sort of vestiges of like, it's a street car, you could use it in this ways. And so the expectations of journalists from the boxer was that it needed to do things that people did with with front engine V12 Ferraris, which was take luggage and go places and turn up for lunch and not have blood be coming out of your ears <laughs> and not be covered in sweat. Right. Uh, and I think people, obviously journalists, didn't appreciate uh, it was, that uh, character. Of the, I, I, the when boxer. I did all the research, I got really angry because I think one of the journalists complained that this was you know there was nowhere to hang your dry cleaning. And I thought, okay, have you mu- fundamentally misunderstood the point of a of a of a twelve cylinder mid engine sports car? Like, to the, the corollary of this today would be like, well, I can't fit, you know, I uh, I can't fit seven kids in my in my two seat sports car. Well, okay, most people who have these cars also have a Range Rover, and and that was, I think, the point that they missed out on. No one was buying this effectively three hundred thousand dollar car in today's money. Well, and that's the role that GTC used to have, and so there's probably some vestiges of old timey thinking, which is that it's a businessman's express kind of. You know, it's yeah. it, you, it was they they were imagining it to do sort of the things that we would use a Ferrari two plus two to do. Right. Now it's interesting. I hadn't thought about that angle. I just thought about the sort of like, okay, you're a journalist, so you're poor. That's what we are, and so you don't understand that the people who have these cars have plenty of other cars. They have country squires and other things to sure. ferry around their 
their sure. offspring. Right, um, and that allows an unchaining of the concept of the car, which should be celebrated instead of right. panned. And I, I, I agree with that point. Like, if you're going to make a mid-engined 12-cylinder car, but of course, with the Testarossa, they kind of... Well, that was that's the next point, right? So the Ferrari probably saw all this bad press, and the, you know it was hot in the cabin, and they were everyone was really pissy it's about quite that. Phys- a lot of physical effort. Right, and so what they did, they replaced the uh, the 365TR with the... 365... Test- BB, uh, BB with the 512 BB and BBI. Right, right. with then the, because this is why it gets so confusing, because it goes 365 BB to 512 BB to 512 BBI to Testarossa to 512 TR to 512 M. Yes, which is, that's right. Which stands for hideous. Yes. Monstrosity. <laughs> um, but that, that's, it just, it goes back and forth a couple of times. But they, the Testarossa was the sort of admission to the market, I the journalist that, okay, well, I guess we got this wrong and now we're going to make a car that's a living room with a flat 12 in the middle of it. Yeah, and they were trying to push this car into a place where it uh, is naturally discontinuous with what a mid-engine 12-cylinder car should be yeah. because that was a, a key demographic and buyer that Ferrari was used to serving, that mission that, that Ferrari mm-hmm. was serving with their 2 plus 2s and... I said you know, that the the, te- the test like it's the like whole- a Bentley competitor almost. The two plus twos are Bentley competitors right. functionally for a lot of people who are shopping for these cars. And I really like thought Continental. I think really Ferrari was lost. Whether this was Enzo, this came from Enzo or anyone else, right? So we have if you think about this, reactionary also, right? Sixties were a sudden the sudden dawn of the mid engine sports car started mm-hmm. of course by the Mira, mm-hmm. and then everyone. Uh, you have to have a little asterisk for the Macho Jet, but yes. That has been acknowledged. Now we can move on so that anybody in the comment section who says the first mid-engine sports car ever was not the Miura. Yes, it was the Matro Jet. Moving on. Okay, moving on. Continue. Uh, that, the Miura sparked a fire. <clears throat> <laughs> it often does. <laughs> Literally, that everyone suddenly wanted to make a mid-engine car. And I hear people say all the time, Ferrari took forever for Enzo resisted, Enzo resisted, Enzo resisted. Really? Let me ask you a question. What year did the Miura make its public debut? 1966. 66. What year did the Dino the mid-engine Ferrari, know, 67, 68. Right. Mm-hmm. So clearly Ferrari wasn't dragging his fucking feet. And then what year did the... Well, and they had also switched for their Grand Prix cars, I think in 61. That's kind of a different story, but we're talking about street Right, cars, but they're but acknowledging yeah. at least that yes. there's a reason. Because I mean, there was also the same thing happening in Formula One. There were mm-hmm. some people who were sticking around trying to make front-engine F1 cars, and then all the people who went mid-engine early on were like... Come on, guys. Come on, yeah. What are you doing? Like, I think it was the 61 season of Formula One where, like, all the Coopers and, and stuff went mid-engined and people, like, were other legacy manufacturers were a little slower to adapt mm-hmm. and to their detriment. Right. For obvious reasons. And there's, I hear, I read all kinds of stuff about Enzo. You know, look, Enzo clearly had a very large disdain for his, pub, for his, for his customers. He, yeah. Much like me, I think he just fucking hated everybody. Um, totally fine. It's an Italian trait. We all we all share that. We're just miserable fucks. Um, I'm projecting. Yes. Um, but yeah, it really there wasn't a big delay. I mean, so we have 64s or 66 Mira. A couple years later is we see uh, Dino, and then 365 BB was two three years after that. 73, 74. I forget. I okay, think it was Paris. Paris. Yeah, a couple yeah. years after that, right? And by the way, developing a car takes a couple years. Mm-hmm. So clearly, Ferrari shifted gears very quickly and was, was working on the mid-engine cars. But I really think it was a fuck up. The idea of a GT of a Grand Touring car with an engine in the middle is stupid, right? Well, yes, and so they didn't make a GT really in the form of the BB because they said it's a twelve-cylinder mid-engine car. It's not really going to be a GT, and people didn't like that. But the experience today of a boxer, I think, stands up really well. It's a it's a really enjoyable car to interact with and use. This car is persistently undervalued, and they have been for decades. I think uh, because to because of what happened with Testarossa. So right, Testarossa replaces the BBs right mm-hmm. with with this incredibly wide body that was all done for cooling. So they can get the the cooling pipes and the radiators out of the front and get them in the side. And the reason they did that was to keep the heat from the engine from in, intruding into the cabin that was one right of the big when you're complaints. running pipes of hot coolant to the front of the car to cool them then it makes the cabin hot and right. people complain uh, the, and it's funny because both ferrari and lamborghini with their second generation mid-engine 12 cylinder cars did exactly the same thing which was move the radiator from the back from the front to the back lamborghini did it i think in a slightly more clever way because they put them up Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why the scoops on top of the Countach mm-hmm. are above the fender line, mm-hmm. which is, I think, stylistically hidden really well. And it also makes the car 
not as wide as a testarossa. Right. I wasn't going to say narrower, but it's yeah, not as wide not as a testarossa. Yeah, but the testarossa strakes were actually not even a design thing. That was the, that's the other. I crazy mean, the treatment revelation. or the treatment of these the holes is right. The holes had to be there for cooling, thing. and the yes. car had the car's a lot. A testarossa is a lot wider at the back than it's right. the front, and it's right. that way so you can get cooling and airflow. Air yeah, and it was meters. actual U.S. highway regulations, DOT regulations. Probably Germany also. Uh, Germany was 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 it resistant is, to? Is, uh, yeah, the. Uh, what is it? The German market 205 T16 mm-hmm. has Testarossa looking strakes over the vents and the rest of the markets in Europe. Mm-hmm. And they never Don't. sold it in the U.S. Don't. Because I think it's a, some kind of German regulation. Interesting. So Yeah, for the U.S. it was a, you have to have a grill or some other thing. You can't fit a baby. If you, fit, if you can fit a baby in there, it's not allowed. Exactly. I guess a small dog. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so what wound up be, being there as a, for a functional reason that was originally not part of the car's design wound up being the Testarossa's defining characteristic. Card. Yeah, and that car possibly because of that looks tits. I mean, it looks like it would drive like an F40, and it doesn't. Yep. I mean, the PR guy from Ferrari at the time described the Testarossa as a 300 kilometer an hour living room. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Um, which I think pulls down the value of the BBs. The only BB that I've ever driven was horribly out of service, and it was magnificent. It was really wonderful. It was a hell of an experience. It yes. sounded great. Yeah. Um, and then the Testarossa. Experientially, would you put it closer to a Mira or a Testarossa? Ooh, closer to a Mira. Yeah. It's Mira without I had to think about misery. that for a moment, but I think I would put it close. It is, cl- if you, you know, if, if one is here, if they're, you know, mm-hmm. one is a 10 and the other is in minus 10. You know, if the mirror is a minus 10 and the Testarossa is a plus 10 or however you want to do it. No, we should reverse the signs. The mirror should be positive 10 and the Testarossa should be minus 10 for being In terms of lame. experience. Yes. Right. Then I the would... the BB is a two. two. I was going to say three. Okay. I was going to say two or three actually, but I was going to sign yeah. it hoping that you signed it the same time. Yeah. No, it's it's nice. Mura Mura has a, a couple of layers of added misery on top. You know, it wants to chop your fingers off. Yeah, it wants misery to without any improvement associated with right. that right i mean it's not a uh, look i've heard people say that mira is a terrible car to drive that's absolute shit it is a terrible car it's a fucking incredible experience and that's what you drive a car like that for and the bb is an incredible experience with a little bit less discomfort i would say mm-hmm. and a little bit less you know like more uh, linear concessions control. yeah from the operator where, where a testarossa is a really good car that i have no interest in ever driving again the 512TR, which was a test. I want to drive facelift. one like at high speed for long distances, just and as the way that someone would drive a 7 Series. Like, I just want to go to Monaco in it. That's what I would in do a with the Testarossa. Testarossa. Yeah. I wouldn't. Really? I would drive a 512TR because at least well, I yes, know I could hear the fucking engine. Yes. That was my biggest disappointment. You have 12 yeah. cylinders. Yeah. Mm, where? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you hear anything. You hear this distant, like, straight six noise that's sort of muffled and, yep. and like, oh, wow, okay. is that 7,500 RPM? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, 512TR is the answer, as we have yeah. described in the past. Okay, uh, what did we do? What did we, what did we, where have we been? Well, I guess the question is, is Enzo, is Enzo, look, is Enzo rolling in his grave over the fact that there's a hybrid V6 296 that's better to drive than the three, uh, than the, 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 the Pista? Yeah, I would go that far. I was just going to say 488, but, or F8, but mm. I've never driven an F8 yet. The same thing. Um, I mean, what what do we know about Enzo? He's, I think if he experienced the performance and had the experience, right? To me, fundamentally, it's about delivering an experience. And if the car delivers an experience and it delivers the performance, I think he's probably would think, be fine with it. Let me ask you a question. Do you think he gave a fuck about that? He uh, Enzo didn't about like which? to drive the experience. Oh, that's true. Enzo didn't like to drive. He was chauffeured around typically. And yes. if he did ever drive one of his cars, it was one of the big fat four seat GTs. Yes. He in his not, old age, he was, but he did previously race. He was forty three or forty eight years old when the company made its first car ever. He was fucking old the entire yeah, time. He was forty eight. Forty eight. Yeah, older than I am. I mean, it might be. Yeah, and he used to be a racing driver, but he was, you know, he was getting old. Yeah, he was getting old. So I, here's the thing that's interesting to me is that if you look at Ferrari's history of road cars, you have you know the early sports cars up into the three hundred eight. This brand was defined by a V twelve. Even Enzo said it. And then the second that that 308 dropped, boom, this brand was defined as a mid-engined V8 company, Mm. period. That also, we should add, 
is partly, especially in the United States, it's influenced by a couple of things, but uh, it's the presence of the 308 in media, and it's the fact that you couldn't buy a flat 12 mid-engine Ferrari in the United States for a decade, uh, because the Boxer was never legal to sell in the United States mm -hmm. for emissions reasons. So you could, and neither was the V12 for us. The only Ferrari you could buy for a decade-long period was a mid-engine Ferrari in the United States from 1974 to 1984. Yeah, there was no twelve-cylinder Ferrari you could buy, and then we didn't. Uh, did we got the four five six? Did we get the? I don't know if we. I don't think we got the four twelve here. So none of those two plus two V twelve Ferraris after the the GT four did we get here? Did the four hundred ever come here? Not officially. They're all really? gray market. Uh, I don't think I realized that. Yeah, I thought they were U.S. spec cars. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. So it it they you know the brand in the United States, which is the biggest market by sales. Yeah. Uh, was defined exclusively by non 12 cylinder mid engine cars. I find it so interesting time. to go back to the 1974 and five reviews of the 308. Uh, with GT4 came first, and then a couple of years later, the, the GTB came. Um, people are like, it doesn't sound like a V8. And I've not found a single journalist who figured out that it was a flat plane crank, and that's why. No one oh, really. The, the idea of a flat plane crank appeared nowhere. They're like, this just doesn't sound like a, four, a V8. It's got its own note and it's its own thing and it's very different and it's zippy and revy and no insight behind that. I found that interesting. As far as I can tell, that is the 308 is the first flat plane crank V8 in the modern era. I don't know of anything else. In the modern era. I mean, it was, I think the last one, the first one was actually like a Buick or somebody somewhere told me maybe. The places I would initially Google to find out uh, whether they were flat planes also would be ATS and uh, Fiat Otovu, but I don't know whether yeah. they are or not. Yeah, they're just, I mean, it was probably, yeah, who knows? But the, you know, this, this flat plane V8, flat plane crank V8 defined this brand for my whole enthusiast life. And now for the first time ever, there's a V6 and I think think that is a better definition of the brand it's than the than the v8 it does a better job mm. and i so i wonder would it warms the dark group? cockles of my heart yeah. which have always been mr like i'm the only one on this island about uh, the the anti-flat plane v8 island the, the flat plane v8 sounds amazing at full bore and and you know when you get intake noise and whatever and i think we both agree that the flat plane v8 in the G 308 gt4 i guess it would be the same in the gtbs and gtss i don't know i've never driven a carbureted one the fuel injection one sounds like shit yes I mean, it's horrid i shouldn't say it's horrid it's deeply uninspiring it sounds yes. like a prius mm -hmm. it sounds like a prius revving to five thousand instead of a ferrari revving to eight seventy seven hundred um but that flat plane v8 has a magnificent talkative fizzy note that's constantly changing with all these different dimensions to it um and that gradually cha that changed fuel injection killed it 308 sounded eh. 328 sounded eh. 348 348 went longitudinal. Mm -hmm. So when 348 went longitudinal, you can have equal length exhaust headers instead of having one bank having longer runners than the other. Mm -hmm. That got the first time I ever heard, that's the first Ferrari that I heard you hear that that really high Yeah, pitched. if you put the right, uh, if you uncork it properly. Even a Mondial T with a stock exhaust. Because it's, it's sweet, longitudinal. Yeah, because yes. it's, a, it's a sweet high pitch, not really loud, not obnoxious, and certainly not what we think of today when we hear things like a, you know, 360 or f430 but i think it peaked at 355 in terms of sound 360 was a notch deeper 430 was a notch deeper 458 was guttural and angry and then the turbos just kind of mm. extinguished all that was left come on that's harsh they still sound they're still an impressive sound but it's not that's just noise complicated it's music loud. that it used to be anyway um, this will be no surprise to any long-term listener or any person who's ever talked to me about cars yeah, but, but listen, a lot of people don't have the luxury of being around these cars. And this is why I wanted to do an Icons on 296, because I really, I was going to get, obviously, a 355 there, because I think that represents the best in terms of all the noise that, that, that the V8s made. And I was going to get the best of the V12s there, and I certainly was going to have a Dino there. And it was just going to be this huge celebration that's now canceled, because Ferrari's chicken chip. Well, now you're canceled too. Because look, I hope you, not. I'm, you know, like I'm just trying to be honest here, and I'm not naming names, but there, there this, you go. Well, there's your problem. I don't need to, right? The company consists of many people, and for whatever reason, the company has decided they won't be on the screen with somebody else, which means I can't show you, and, and I can't do instrumented testing numbers without the team there, and it's going to take takes three months, and literal whole team has to come over from Italy, and I'm really sorry. That's just not the way the world works, right? I'm going to fucking Turo one. 
which is exactly what I told the guys on the phone. I'm like, I don't make, please don't make me Toro one. Because if you're so concerned with how bad, how well you perform, I can tell you that just whatever car that you guys own and maintain that's sitting on a lot somewhere that you can just give to me will be far better off than some beat up, ragged out pile of shit for mis- mismatched tires that I get on Toro. I don't want to do that to you guys. Please, this is not the same world. Toro exists. The internet exists. I can write one note and I can have somebody's car with the wrong license plates on it and you'll never know who owns it so you can't ban them and it'll be in the video. Yeah, it just has to be red. Just <laughs> like all the yeah, others. Just please don't do this to me and they're too scared. So Enzo is not rolling in his grave for V6 and probably not rolling in his grave about his his the the servants of his brand trying to protect this brand name. And that is both the reason why Ferrari is where it is and the reason why I think Ferrari is a, is a fading flame to younger enthusiasts Mm, quite controversial that do you agree do i agree um i know we're probably at two hours paulo just dropped dead yes Uh, he's gone into hibernate mode to save power on him his his person (laughs) um uh do i do i I think it's i i think there's a lot of people who have like f1 keeps things alive for a lot of people there's a mystique Mm. that is pretty indelible uh, for me, yes, but I'm. I know that I'm an outlier. I don't know what the mainstream. Yeah, pipe up in the comments or whatever. Yeah, but I'm maybe curious you, to know. You interact with with young collectors all the time. Are they buying McLarens? Mm-hmm. Or are they been they buying Porsches? Oh yeah. Are they buying Ferraris too? Mm, some of them are. Someone will always be there. Yeah, for sure. Look, they're also Ferrari had a record year, eleven thousand something units. Like what? They're doing great. My question is, are the people who are your actual age. Right. Are they, they, this is a question that like, it's like actually a little bit like BMW because BMW's buyers have shifted yeah. to people who are interested in the brand mm-hmm. and what it stands for. And there is less of the like driving enthusiast, hardcore, you know, vehicle dynamics, vehicle experience people in their mix. It mm-hmm. is a necessity to grow. And perhaps Ferrari has chosen the same thing. There's only so many of those people on the planet. And not enough to, you know, if you're selling 200 cars a year, it's easy to find those that number of people. If you're trying to sell 11, 10,000 cars well, they a year. Were, they were the most profitable car company on earth selling 7,000. So what's the push for? I mean, 11,000 now and then Puro Sangue comes out next year. A fucking SUV with a Ferrari badge on it. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that's really the right move for that brand. Is it but if, it, if they're going to keep printing money, then that's a, you know that's the direction sign this of the time. This is the, the problem with capitalism because because as you just pointed out, without pointing out, Ferrari's not in business to make cars. Ferrari's in business to make money. And, and Kuro Sangue will do that. And piss Jason off, which is also right. a worthy cause for existing. And that's the end of this episode. <laughs> this has been episode 80-something of the Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason Camisa. I'm that Derek is Tam hyphen Scott. It was very mean to me. And uh, this is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. The and end. <laughs>